we do need to talk about some things in regards to Stronghold that kind of caught my attention. Maybe you know about this, maybe you don't. But yes, let's jump into it. So we're going to start things off with this. And this is from fintechnexus.com. And the reason why I'm pointing this out tonight is some of the things you see right here. It says combining payments infrastructure for merchants, digital lending, and even DeFi. Yes, DeFi with Stronghold S, uh, CEO Sean Bennett. Now, fast forward it a little bit. You guys know about Lex Friedman, right? A lot of you guys watch his, you know, pod, or listen to his podcast, watch his program on YouTube. He's also on Twitter. He's a big, big name in regards to um, this whole thing of, you know, social journalism, if you will. So he did interview back in January 20th, 2023, with Sean Bennett, CEO over at Stronghold. Now, while some people may have listened to this, there's a lot of us that are new to Stronghold. I thought this interview was absolutely solid. I won't play the whole thing, but I'm going to play some of this, and then I'm going to get into the next part of what I want to point out and why I think it's a big deal in regards to the whole thing of payment infrastructure. We're going to talk about the whole thing with Visa. I want you to hear this. I think it is a big deal if you understand the bigger picture of Stronghold. So before we play it, Lex does in fact interview Sean Bennett. And like it says, Sean started out as an independent software developer building software for clients. This experience led him to the entrepreneurship and he used his skills to tackle the problem of remittance. You know how many times you hear about remittances when it comes to payment platforms, especially when it comes to Ripple, Stellar, and so on? So he himself created CoinX, like it says, a stable coin issuer on what, guys? The Ripple network. You ever wonder about, like, why Ripple and Stronghold? Why Ripple, or excuse me, why Stronghold and even Stellar? Again, birds of the feather flock together. I mean, it's, it's a thing. But it says it allowed people to send money cheaply, quickly. However, he early he was an early regulatory or saw regulatory challenges, excuse me, and user adoption um, issues meant that the project was not successful. Sean eventually left that project and moved to his next venture, of course, which was um, Stella, a fork of Ripple. Funny how that name is called Stella. Maybe she got her groove back, right? Or he got his groove back. That's a big bad pun. Old movie from the nineties, right? It was a fork of Ripple, settling the foundations for eventually starting up his own company obviously we don't know where this goes right stronghold defi had enabled financial services company for institutional clients I'm gonna go ahead and play some of this I'm gonna come out of the frame listen to this for a moment here we go um to today's conversation i'm really excited to have with us sean bennett who is the co-founder at stronghold a really compelling fintech company that we'll talk about and we'll talk about applications infrastructure and the building of technologies in general as well so with that sean welcome to the podcast thanks very much for having me on Lance. my pleasure i think one of the treats for this year for me is just meeting new people and learning about new companies and i think this year is really revealing the kinds of companies that are able to stick around, generate value and have sustainability and sustainable advantage. And so I'm excited to double click on Stronghold and learn more. So let's start with a bit of where you come from and how you come to this industry. You know, and in particular, I was really interested in, you know, the beginning of your career where you were working as an independent software developer, because a lot of people have much more traditional paths. It seemed that you really explored how it was possible to build technology and that kind of led you to entrepreneurship. Can you open those up for us a little bit? Like what were your early experiences building software? You know, early on for me, building software started off as, as more of a hobby, a way to fund myself through college. So originally uh, I was planning on attending medical school and that's indeed what I did for uh, about three and a half years in New Zealand. And through that time, you know, as well as going to lectures and going to labs and, you know, making sure I was progressing on that front, I was spending a lot of time building software. You know, I, I jumped on those online platforms, you know, Elance before it turned into Upwork and was, was just building software for clients as, as a contractor. What really engaged me with that was the ability to, you know, quite quickly turn thoughts into my, in my head into, you know, actual deliverables. That was, that was super exciting for me and the ability to 
you know, not not just be building exactly to spec, but be able to, you know, put my own own spin or, you know, treat it as a bit of an art form is what really attracted me to that. And I, I think that over time, what I realized was I was less and less interested in, in going down that traditional path of becoming a physician, right, which was, there was a lot of rote learning. It didn't really give me space to be able to, I felt at least, think for myself or to go out there and, and build solutions to problems that I saw out there in the world. It was a, a little bit too, you know, focused on, on a single thing. I loved a lot of, a lot of the patient interaction in, in that piece, but I, I did feel a little bit boxed in. You know, I, uh, I want to start tackling, right, as I'm sure a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs see all those problems out there. But the big one that I was always interested in was remittance growing up. So as a, as a young person growing up in New Zealand, my mother was Filipino. She would send money back to our family back in the Philippines. And, you know, 10 years ago, very, very different to today with, you know, Western Union and the, the rest of those companies, transfer wise, very, very uh, digital focused these days, but back then very manual, much more expensive, huge delays, huge, huge costs for what really were small amounts of money. I, I thought there has to be a better way of going about this. And we've the timing coincided with Bitcoin coming out and then, you know, some of the, the advances in the crypto space from there. So that's really what took me from, okay, I'm, I'm seeing these problems. I know how to build software. Can I go and have a stab at, at some of these things myself? Quite naively, right, to, to think that I could, I could do something just as an individual, but it was, that, that's how I started off. Just, just start building technology and, and see who I can meet in the space. So, so that's really what, what took me off. One of the things I wanted to just push on a little bit more, because I think it's probably informative for how you might think about the world, is what is it like to be a software developer that works on a lot of stuff versus one that is working on you know a dedicated project? Like no normative judgment on my end about like working on a big project versus working on a lot of projects, especially because I think when you are working on many projects, you're sort of acting as somebody who's running a business with the clients being people for whom you develop the software. And then at some point, when you have your own company, your own sort of tech startup, you're running a business where the development of the software is in the service of the end clients, the end customers. And I wonder like what your, again, kind of going to that foundational experience of having the folks that you write software for be your clients. Were there any learnings there? Were any patterns kind of come up and maybe any contrast to having more ownership through the entire product development process? It's a great question. What I really loved about working for multiple clients at once and having a lot of projects in the air was that it, it, it really taught me to balance my time and focus. That That, that seems obvious, but it, it also meant that I was getting exposure to a lot of different problems all at once. And I had to very quickly be able to understand their particular context, their industries, so I could build the best solution for them. And so even though I was doing, I started off more on the contractor side, in about two to three years after kicking off, I was more doing consultative work. And some of that would lead to starting off actual development, and sometimes I would then be handing over to a team. And I think that that, that early experience really transitioned me really well into coming into you know, my own startup and my own business. Even though I now work in more of a, hey, here's one industry or a couple of industries we might interact with, and here's your context, I think that my mind a lot of the time is more thinking about the client than it is sort of sitting inside the four walls of strongholds or, you know, whatever I happen to be working on. And I feel like in some of the space in, in crypto, generally, it, it feels like the, the, the thinking is more just on the technology or, or whatever the project happens to be. But for me, it's important to a lot of the time be thinking in, in the client's shoes and, and just building for them. And if that means that we're changing our product or we have to do something dramatically different because it will benefit that client a lot more, so be it. And so that's the thinking that I brought through from those early years. So let's discuss this for a moment. Okay. So 
you heard Sean specifically talk about remittances. This is one of the key things I want you to take away from all of this, okay? So I want to put some focus on remittances, and I want to highlight this for you tonight, <clears throat> especially Strongholds, your thing, and you're wondering, where are we going with this? So this is cited from a site called the IMF.org. You guys are familiar with the IMF. Who is that? Well, come on. Think about how many times you've seen, you know, researchers, whether it's myself, whether it's, uh, you know, guys like Tokenizer, you know, and so on. What are we always talking about every now and then? The International Monetary Fund and this shift, the shift to this new system, right? So look at this for a second, you know. I want to talk about this. I went ahead and highlight this for you. Boosting flows. This, again, from the IMF. So I love this statement because, again, back to the whole thing of what Sean was talking about with remittances. Governments have often offered incentives to increase remittance flows. Think about that for a second. Remittance flows and to channel them to productive uses. But such policies are more problematic than efforts to expand access to financial services or reduce transaction costs. Tax incentives may attract remittances, but they also encourage tax evasion. That's not cool. Don't want to turn to Alphonse Capone, do we? No. Mashing fund programs to attract remittances from migrant associations may divert <clears throat> funds from the other local funding priorities. While efforts to channel remittances to investment may have met with little success, fundamentally, remittances are private funds that should be traded, or not traded, treated, excuse me, I've been reading too much today, like other sources of household income. Efforts to increase savings and improve the allocation of expenditures should be accomplished through improvements in the overall investment climate rather than by targeting remittances. And who kind of mentioned some of this? This is Dilip Ratha. He's a lead economist at the World Bank. Remember how many times we mentioned the World Bank today? Quant coverage, stellar coverage. He's also an advisor to the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. Now, my key takeaway in regards to this, the interview with Lex with Sean of Stronghold. Here's some of my notes, like Biggie, relax and take notes. So this whole thing about remittances, okay? You have to keep in mind, you know, that this whole thing of like the governments that have offered incentives to increase remittance flows, just like what you just saw there. Here's my takeaway of why treating remittances like other incomes or income sources is indeed significant and what it means, especially when it comes to stronghold, SHX. So three key things in regards to the significance in regards to this. It's efficiency. It simplifies policy. Hear me out. It reduces the whole thing of risk of unintended consequences, just like I also mentioned right there from the IMF, tax evasion. But like tax evasion with incentives, about empowerment. Households have more control over how they use their money, potentially leading to better decisions for their needs. I mean, say what you want. What's one of the biggest problems here in the United States? It's all the debt. All these people taking on credit cards and running up that debt, getting so buried into debt that they can't ever pay off these credit cards. So what they do, they file for bankruptcy. And when that is, what does that lead to? The people that have this American dream of buying their first home or having a home, period, doesn't seem like it's ever going to happen. It creates a snowball effect. It's a bad thing. What about growth? Remittances can contribute to a broader economic development if used effectively. Absolutely. And Stronghold is at the forefront of all that? I like that. You should like it too. And it targets them might the targeting, I should say, of course, might hinder this. But there's implications, of course, that we should talk about, you know, we're trying to be positive in regards to stronghold. So 
There's, of course, this focus on financial infrastructure. Stronghold in itself might benefit from focusing on improving access to financial services for remittance recipients. And this, of course, can include, and I know it sounds kind of positive, but there's a little bit of positive and negative. Hear me out. It's going to include lower transaction costs for sending and receiving money. I mean, think about it. Why wouldn't, you know, your Ripple XRPs and your Stellar XLNs, you know, why wouldn't they have a partnership with the likes of Stronghold? That simply makes sense. It's going to create the whole thing of investment options, uh, make it easily accessible to, and cater to different risk appetites. You know, again, back to um, some of these migrants and so on who are from overseas and so on. Remittances simply make sense if it's working with those who will directly benefit from it. There's another topic I want to bring up, financial education. Yes, financial education, this whole focus of being able to help families make informed financial decisions. Just because you feel as though that you had the same education as everybody else, understand there's other areas in the world where people didn't get that same type of education. Now, two other things I want to talk about is the strategic shift. If you see the IMF talking about the whole thing about going to a new monetary system and citing some things in regards to remittances, especially when it comes to, uh, what do we talk about? Governmental, uh, you know, governments that have offered incentives to increase remittance flows and boosting those flows. You have to keep in mind that there's going to be a strategic shift in regards to all of this. So Stronghold, SHX, was previously involved in programs targeting just that, remittances for specific uses. And, of course, they might need to adjust their approach, but at the same time, for us who hold the token, there is what? There is a market opportunity in regards to this, and I think Stronghold also recognizes this. So. By providing a growing empowered recipient base, it could create a larger market for strongholds financial services. So at the end of the day, you've got to keep in mind whether stronghold or other ones that deal with remittances, other income does create a more stable and potentially more impactful environment, right? You know, having more than one income is better than just you know, like being uh, the breadwinner for your family, and that's where it ends because that breadwinner might have ties to family that it's overseas. How is that going to work out? Remittances gets the job done because it boosts the flow of money. You know, think about the bigger picture of things, people making better decisions. Stronghold can adapt by focusing on what, guys? Building robust financial infrastructure that caters to the needs of remittance recipients and their families and their families families it's a good thing